Gaming NBS episode 121. Happy New Year! Welcome to Gaming NBS, a tabletop RPG podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Sean. And I'm Brett. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to our usual listeners. Thanks for being here. And as Sean said, Happy New Year. We survived. At least I'm hoping you survived if you're listening to this. And it is now 2017. We made it. And well, the uh, the mongrel wished us a happy uh, New Year ahead of our uh, central time zone New Year. So apparently the, um, the, the future wasn't too scary because I didn't, uh, he didn't tell us about, you know, horrible robots taking over in Terminators or something terrible like that. So I think we're okay. Good to know. So far. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. Because when, when would the mongrel steer us wrong when it comes to world dominating robots? He would never do that. True. Nah, uh, that I know of. Correct. All right. So, announcements. I was just telling Sean before we started this thing. At this time next week, I will be closing down Evercon of 2017, January 6th to the 8th. Folks have talked about it plenty of times. This is the last time you can hear about it. As a preview, it's coming. It is this coming week. Oh, my God. Uh, Thursday is the big setup day. Gates open Friday. Then we have all day Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So hopefully it should be a good time. Things are coming together quite nicely. Um, uh, yeah. We got Kevin and uh, a number of other folks can help do some games on demand stuff. We got uh, Tim Seeley, artist. I've got um, Lloyd Metcalf, artist, game designer guy. We also have Ken Height. I think people have heard of him. He's coming. So it uh, should be a pretty good, uh, goddamn good time. So, oh, before I go too crazy, though, Sean, Sean, did we hit a level of patron we, that I need to? We <clears throat> did, Brett. Oh, Lord. Yes. Uh, we had a couple <clears throat> people chip in recently, which we will give them praise and thanks in the in the patron. Uh, but it was, I think, Mark Tasaka. Um, okay. No, actually, no, it wasn't Mark. No, it wasn't Mark. Um, Graham Minert, I think, pledged specifically to put us at the mark that would force me to not force you to not curse an entire episode. All right. So, are you just going? Are we gonna? If anyone listens to it live, I'm not gonna watch it. You're gonna go back and bleep it out, or should I really try? Uh, no, dude, don't make me bleep it out, you dick. <laughs> Now, I was trying to see if I can put the work on you instead of me. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, we did have Todd McGowan also pledge as well that put us over the hump there. And I have I have to put the Sean talks in an accent level in, in the Patreon goals. Yeah, I think that needs to be about thousand two thousand dollars. I think is where that needs to sit. Well, I don't. I think it's gonna just be like another buck, <laughs> another dollar. Yeah, so Give me a dollar. Just one more buck. You know what we should do? Here's one what? tactic people haven't really. What? Maybe they have. Every time, just a new, just one more patron. We have to do something. Oh, every time a new patron joins, we have to do something. Yeah, just every time a new could patron run, could run out of creative like ideas. Minimum of a dollar. I don't know. Maybe we'll like we'll have to implement. Uh, some wacky word during the show. Oh, like know. in uh, have you ever seen Super Troopers? The movie. What? Okay, to- totally bad aside. It's uh, Super Troopers. It's a movie. It's uh, I know the movie. The- I haven't seen it. Okay, so there's a piece in there. It's uh, st- state cops, and there's a point there where they're trying to get one of their partners has to say the word meow in co- in conversation like nine times. So it pulls the guy over. Hey, meow. You know why I meow pulled you over, meow? Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he has to deadpan it so the guy doesn't know why he's saying it, you know? So anyway, I could see you doing that. Oh, shall we get on with the show before we get, before we make this even worse? 2017 off to a cracking good start. Yes, it is, I think. I mean, it's early yet, but I mean, it's kind of like what they say when you start a job. You are You are doing an awesome job. The only way you can do go is down. <laughs> right? You start out. Yeah. This is this is where you're starting out. This is the bar. So you showed up. You've met expectations. That's good. <laughs> All right. Let's see what we can do. All right. Let's get into random encounter. 
Random Encounter, segment in the show where you field voicemails, emails, comments from social media. Um, we've got a few this week, not too many. Um, it's been relatively quiet because of the holidays, I'm guessing. Absolutely. This happened last time, too. Yeah. Uh, so, Brett, you go ahead and start, man. But you got to say Shh. the name correctly. This is Chris Steele. Yeah, very good. Right very in. well done, Brett. I, I've been practicing. I saw this coming up. I was practicing my steel earlier. Hey, BSers. It's been a while since I've commented, but wanted to drop you some quick feedback on two of your recent episodes. If he cu- if he curses in this, it's not my fault. You know, I, I, I put it out there, and I think a lot of people, I'm like, hey, man, we're recording Sundays, so, you know, if you got stuff for Brett to say or <laughs> to antagonize him with, now is That was a good time. way to go for it. But nice. I think it's, they're going to miss out on the window of opportunity. So first, religion, says Chris. I think using a pantheon that backs up the setting you're using is a great idea if it's done in moderation. I don't think everyone in the world needs to be actively uh, praying to one god or another. There's no need to call out that the blacksmith is saying a prayer before he starts work. Relating it back to our real world, it'd be a little weird if the mechanic prayed before working on the car. However, in other situations, we expect it, church holidays, etc. Moderation is the key here. It's also important to limit the number of gods your campaign focuses on. Choose one or two, preferably the ones your player characters are tied to, if any, and highlight them as opposed to trying to cover the entire Forgotten Realms pantheon, for example. Very good point. Very good point, Chris. He continues, a few successes I've had in one of my Dark Sun campaign, it focused on Tekulite. 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 All right. <laughs> good Lord. I almost cursed right at the end of that. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Anytime something bad happened, the table would say something along the lines of, I can't. <laughs> Damn. Uh, Tektukale. There you go. Granted, he was a sorcerer king and not a real god, but the people of the world really didn't know the difference, and the players naturally cursed his name, making my job easier. In my Pathfinder campaign, it was about uh, Iomade and Desna. The paladin followed Iomade, and the entire party received visions from her. The cleric followed Desna and was a secondary player in the story, but we ignored all the other gods. In, most, in our most recent campaign, the pantheon was made up of the previous characters in the last campaign. Well, that's neat. The original campaign ran over two years from levels 1 to 30, 4th edition D&D. 30th level, holy cow. And they all became gods in the end. 3,000 years later, the next campaign started, and each of the old characters had their own domain they reigned over. Um, it is a heck of a time, uh, consuming setup, but it was awesome because all the players quote unquote knew the Pantheon already because they lived it in short. I think you should keep it subtle. Use it when it's needed by the story and hand wave it when it's not. As for creative spell casting, DMs beware It is great to encourage the player to think outside the box. When you have a player casting, create water as a cantrip in Pathfinder to suffocate people or flood a city, you have to let the, you've let the game get broken in the case of Pathfinder, even more broken. I have a player that's always trying to use spells in creative ways, and I have finally had to make a rule uh, for how it can be done. Simply put, a spell can not do more than another spell of its level could. If it overlaps with another spell's effects, the creative spell will have a slightly lesser effect. For example, yes, you can cast Create Water to try to suffocate a dragon. It's a level 1 spell in 5e. So it can work like any other level 1 spell at a slightly lesser effect. In this case, I'd say it could either do damage, such as inflict wound, but with a saving throw for half damage, or it could allow everyone affected by the next use of the dragon's breath weapon uh, by giving them all advantage on their saving throw as such modified protection from good and evil. So two points here. Don't let the spell become more powerful than it should be just because of creative use, because that will set a precedent that's hard to undo. And second, be as creative in the effects as the player is trying to be in its use. Just spell out what the spell will do when creatively used so the player can decide to do it or not. <clears throat> Excuse me. One exception. If it's a really cool use, but far out there uh, for power level, I've allowed it with an arcana check of 20 plus. Okay, you can try it, but you're going to have to roll for that effect. This keeps it from being used that way all the time, but still gives a chance to something really cool to happen. And I'll be darned at uh, how often nat 20s come up during those crazy situations. Keep up the good work. I do, I do, I just substitute words there. I did okay. Your turn. This is the only episode that we can actually have played in a friendly local game store. 
Yeah, it's going to be our worst one. Anyway, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, my man. I, the, I don't know. All right. Uh, from Mark to Saka. To Saka. One of our patrons, man. That's right. Hi, Brett and Sean. I know how you are both Dungeon Crawl Classic fans. Just wanted to let you know that I created the Dungeon Crawl Classics fan page which has character generators, homebrew character sheets, adventures, and other such resources. The website is a a bit of a hobby project of mine, and I am planning on adding more character generators and resources to the site on an ongoing basis. Please click on the following link to visit the website. That's http www.oldschooladventures.org forward slash dcc. If you think the DCC fan site and character generators are worthy, I would be honored if you could mention it in die rolls. Shit, man. We're going to mention it in random encounter, maybe, and die rolls. Absolutely. No, this is pretty cool. I was looking at this earlier. Um, Kind of neat. Generate characters. Nice. Nice. Right there. I got four of them. I got a merchant, a corn farmer, a halfling tailor, and an elven scholar. That, my friends, is what DCC funnels are made of. Carry on. Brett. You mentioned that after your Traveler campaign is over, you will be starting a DCC campaign. You could use the character funnel level zero generator on the first page of the site to generate a batch of zero zero level characters for your PCs. As well, there are other resources you could use from the site for your campaign. Very nice. Sean, I think that is so wonderful how you donated gaming products for Christmas gifts for a needy family and how you are volunteering your time to run games for kids. You are an excellent role model and an inspiration. Well, that's very kind of you to say that about Sean. It is very kind, and and now I feel obligated to make that happen. <laughs> I'm in the process, Mark. Man, I'm, you know. Let's, <laughs> no, let's, nope. Sorry, you're already inspiring people. Let's get not, off your butt. Let's not get put the butt, cart before the horse, my man. Too late. Uh, congratulations on reading, uh, reaching seventy five bucks and pledges per episode. I would like to wish you and your loved ones the very best in 2017. Thank you for the excellent work that you have put into your podcast. Sincerely yours, Mark Tasaka, one of your Canadian listeners slash patrons. Oh, very cool. Yes, Another Canadian joins the fold. Indeed. Yes. Thank you so much, Mark, for writing in. Much appreciated. Um, definitely check out his DCC stuff. Very cool. All right. All right. Michael Phillips wrote in as well. Said I want to run and play more games. I have a weekly game, but I want a bigger, more fluid meetup style thing, something like the Gauntlet. I'd sort of like to do the ten by ten challenge sort of thing, where you play ten sessions of ten different systems, but without a large group of potential GMs and players. I lack the depth of field for that. Alternately, maybe I could go all uh, to all five local cons with gaming tracks. My wish list right now. Who pretty good stuff here? Dresden Accelerated, Shatter and War on Anarchy, which is a uh, Shadowrun setting story game rules, SR setting story game. Uh, oh, Shadowrun setting story game rules. Masks. You just watch all of Young Justice and wants to play that too bad. Um, Apocalypse World 2, either the Firefly Hack or Blades in the Dark or Uncharted Worlds. 5e, Amber or Lords of Gossamer and Shadow. More Dungeon World. And one of the Gumshoe campaigns, World Breaker, Armitage Files, Eternalize, or maybe Dracula Dossier. From the podcast, I actually find the you shouldn't get, uh, get to playing uh, uh you shouldn't get to playing complex teamwork and combat argument unconvincing uh, yeah this is a <laughs> this is an interesting one i don't think in the moment planning is actually planning but as a representation of the hundreds of hours the party spends together doing things really doing the really boring part where they plan and drill and develop tactics to come up with a sort with shorthand ways of communicating Oh, okay. See, now okay. We, we did touch that a little bit. I we did touch it, but he's doing this as kind of a sourcing the table th- type of thing, right? Oh. Saying, look, clearly you've all played, you've all adventured forever. You're all fifth level. What would you guys do in, you know, in the, you know, in the goblin, the goblin gambit? What's your goblin gambit look like? Oh, it looks like this. And you have a chance to play it. Play so it. now I, I absolutely agree with him on that aspect. Like once you are an adventuring party, and you've got your proverbial, hey, hey, Brett, when you got your proverbial shit together, <laughs> you, I think that that's absolutely acceptable because it, it shows that you've adventured together and that you are a well-oiled 
uh, combat team, I guess, for lack of better words. So, yes. Hmm. All right, man. I'm, I'm good with that to some degree. Like, hey, if he gets too nuts, like, hey, you know. Uh, well, he's got more to say here. So I know. Let's see let's, what he has to say. All right. So, Michael continues, with any group of adventurers that doesn't get eaten in their first adventure will learn to work as a team, but that learning part is incredibly dull to actually play out. There's a reason that the ensemble action uh, shows do it do at most montages, but are often willing to assume that the viewers are smart enough not even to need that. Farrick's Young Justice, Young Justice has a football-style numbers play system where we're never shown them developing. The second bit about making your players rush their decisions and possibly punishing them for not reacting quickly enough, I call BS. Oh! Well, well, I didn't swear. Use an acronym. I got a way around it. You did. Good job, Brett. Way to go, man. You even, you even <laughs> like... You know, you dodged the freaking I do, I dodged, the literal, I dodged the literate the, bullet. Yeah, it didn't hit the uh, didn't hit the fan on that one. Hey, bravo! Um, that is man. absolutely hey, a great way. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Michael says that's actually a great way to make that table a hostile place for people with several different uh, ways of uh, neural pr- processing. Oh, okay, fair enough. And the people who most need not to be put under that sort of stress in their reactions are those that are least likely to speak up and most likely to fall victim to similarly bullying tactics in real life. I argue you can reward rapid play without punishing players who need or want a more measured place, or pace, I believe is what he means to say, and without verbally ratcheting up the pressure pressure to make quick decisions. All right, so... Michael, that is a very good point, and we do not want to, neither Sean nor I want to condone bullying or pressuring or if you have someone at the table or if you're yourself or a person at the table who, you know, you process things at a different pace than everyone else around you. That's absolutely legitimate, and it doesn't make you a bad person or foolish or stupid or anything like that. People do process and move differently. I think to better clarify, Sean and I usually are referring to the people that basically lock up and do the analysis paralysis component is usually what we're referring to. But what you're bringing up here, Michael, is a very good uh, very good thing to keep in mind, and uh, I want to make sure that that's something that we keep in the back of our mind, Sean, as we talk about that again, because that's a good point. Yeah? Yeah. You agree with me? Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> he continues with Brett. Have you looked at Shadowrun Anarchy? It is the Shadowrun setting on the backbone of the Cosmic Patrol game, a much lighter narrative-based uh, focus system by Catalyst. I have not, but I'm going to have to check it out. I haven't Shadow either, Run and Anarchy. that appeals to me because I, I the, my first real exposure to Shadowrun was 5th edition. It was... Not fun? It was okay. I mean, it was good because it was new. I hadn't played. I had 3rd and 4th and never played. But yeah, it's... Uh, the book layout's wonky, a lot of... Hmm. Yeah. So I, I am actually interested to find out how that shadow on anarchy is myself. Cosmic patrol. Yeah. Hmm. I've yeah, never cosmic heard of patrol. cosmic patrol. Yeah, it's out there. It's a uh <coughs> it's not a it's not a big book. Um I want to say it's like a digest size and it's not I can't remember the rule set. All right, I'll have to look into it. He finishes up with a Sean, what branch are you looking at? Assuming the timing works out, I'd be happy to run games for kids. I used to do a similar thing at a friendly local gaming store for high school students in a different Madison. Hmm, cool. So we might have another person who's willing to assist you and gain yeah. you more accolades. Yeah, I don't know. Michael, are you? I, I I don't know if he, I didn't know if he was local or not. Oh, I see. But anyways, hmm. uh, the answer to that is the Lakeview branch, if you're familiar with Madison. Um, that's the one I'll be gunning for. And Michael, yes, I, I am. I'll have to like make a note of that. I have an ongoing list of people that have expressed interest, so that I can say, "Hey, what's you know?" What you said you'd like up? to help. Hey, guess yeah. what? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, hey, yeah. guess what? Here's the time to help. But we'll see. Uh, I know people have obligations, so I'll put you on the list. Thanks, Michael, so much. I think that's it. That is it, man. Let's go on. All Let's right. do it. Main topic. Main topic. Yeah. Huh. What's in a name? Yeah, my, Matt Bonhoff brought this up. A couple other BSers Bonhoff. asked for it as Bonhoff. well. Bo- B-O- Bonhoff? B-O-H. Bonhoff. Oh. Bonhoff is B-A-H. Hmm. He complimented me for pronouncing his name right. It's Bonhoff. All right, it's Bonhoff. All right, all Matt right, all right. Matt B. Matt B. 
<laughs> See, now my, name, my my last name is Blazinski, so whatever. I I get it. I get that. I get that. I get it. I'm trying to I aggravate Brett. It. Oh, you're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. God, you got um, such, wanted... such discipline, Brett. Man, I am impressed. Yeah. This is uh, 26 years of martial arts training. Just just trying to keep it under the top. Um, what the, uh, basically, we want to talk about what the quality and type of names we use in our games tell us about a setting. And also, ba- basically, it also brought to my mind some different terms or names that things have within a game itself. Um, like dungeon master, game master, storyteller, and so forth. We'll chat about that in a bit here, as obviously, as we get into it. I think the uh, <clears throat> the main thing, Sean, that this brings to mind is your comment of Grickers, Brickers, Jickers, whomever errors and whatever errors you did with your gnomes. But it's that idea of kind of a serious versus silly names as far as for PCs and NPCs and settings or uh, place names even. <clears throat> I think there's... There is a tendency, especially when you've been gaming with people for a long time, regardless of the name I come up with, whatever it is, no matter how I spell it out, I say it out loud, I try to make funny things that rhyme with it. It's kind of like naming your kid, right? You don't want to give your name a kid that will lead to some horrible schoolyard razzing type of thing. So you try to come up with a name that fits, especially when you're talking fantasy names and when some sometimes we feel the need to be a little um more, uh, what do I want to say, more flourish on the names, you know, looking at... Drizzt and all these different variations and multiple consonants and bizarre vowel connections. It's very common that sometimes that stuff just becomes silly, right? Whether you mean it or not, someone at your table is going to go, oh, you mean this. And then, oh, great. Yes. So, yes, it's the, yes, it's Lord Sexy. That's what I meant. It's Lord Sexy. Yes, that's that's his name. It's it's not supposed to be that, but that's what somebody heard. So that's what they say. And now now your main bad guy is demoted to Lord Sexy, the bad, right? Total pain in the tuchus. So I said tuchus. (laughs) I had that one in the back of my head just in case I needed it. Um, (laughs) So, Sean, when you you game, let's talk, I guess, maybe not only just fantasy or whatever, do you have issue with silly versus serious names or nomenclature of any kind like that? Does that does that is that something that drives you bananas as a gamer? It depends on what is kind of proposed. Like, well, if I'm playing tune, I would expect it to be a little slapsticky. Goofy, yeah, right. Funny. Well, what's the tone of the game is the key piece of this. Like, if you're gonna run, if I'm gonna run Saving Private Ryan. I mean, I imagine if one guy or gal, their character is a little, maybe they've, they've got a wacky name. Because there are wacky names in real life. Yeah, but if you make a guy who's Sergeant Facey McFacerton. <laughs> right, yes. Right, you'd be like, really? Yes. Sergeant Facey McFacerton? Right. So let, let me ask this perhaps in a more uh, direct um, attack back at you is, so when you make Grickers, Drickers, and Brickers? Yes, was that supposed to be a serious setting? And were you just jacking around <laughs> with your game master? Or were you, or was it supposed to be like you that? You know, Sean? you know, Brett. Um, well, it's all based on the setting, as you said. They're the gnomes. Feel of the they're gnomes, man. They're, you know, gnomes have wacky little. I mean, you had like you, in your in your game, you had like uh, what's his name, Fiddlebottom. That's true. We did have a Milo Fiddlebottom. Which, yes, which I don't think Milo is, I think that's not, I don't think that's bad at all. As a matter of fact, I think that's in a completely different category because it's a halfling. And I think that, you know, you get some of those. But like if you had, unless you had a, like, I think when the gnome thing came up, I thought the whole party would be full of gnomes and we would all be like frickers, drickers, grickers, brickers, trickers, whatever, right? It's just a bunch of gnomes. It's kind of like, hey, it's not too far off from the freaking Lord of the Rings, my man. No, you're absolutely right. Boing, so that, boing, that's a very, whatever, yeah. boing, doing, join, whatever. Yeah. Biffer, boffer, bofer, bomber, balin, dwalin, dory, nori, ori. Yeah, all of all the dwarves. Yeah, man, Hobbit, see, right? see. So there is, <coughs> excuse me, there is some, not only there, but in a number of Rumpelstiltskin and so forth, even with... In fairy tale and such, you do get odd or quasi silly or bizarre rhyming names. I mean, I, I know people whose whose children are named things that rhyme, right? One kid's named Mary and the other one's named Terry. Really, Mary and Terry, you know. But that's just what they did or whatever. So I guess there is there is a hmm. What did I say? I think you're right though. It is kind of it does come to what's the feel that we're trying to get in the world. I think it's okay. There comes a point, though, when 
Brickers, Drickers, Grickers, and Milo Fiddlebottom and Mary and Terry can become and you know can turn into Lord Sexy. Lord Sexy is clearly one of those names that is designed to um, just be flat out silly. That's kind of a Monty Python-y type of thing, right? It's spelt Smythe, but it's pronounced Throat Wobbler Mangrove type of deal, right? It's when you take it to that direction, what does that do for you? Yeah, that's no. Don't like it? No. Well, uh, so what I would propose. It drives, I'll just, I'll say it right now, it drives me absolutely bananas. God, that was really hard. Um, <laughs> it drives me bananas <laughs> to uh, to have that happen. It's one thing if everyone. Bananas, once in a while, not to be mistaken for ape shit. Not, no, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. No, not at all. Um, but anyway, that. It is irritating when my players will take something and go, oh, you mean Lord Sexy or, you know, Queen Latifah? Ha, ha, ha. It's Queen Latifah, isn't it? No, it's not Queen Latifah. That's not who this is. And they'll take it and take something that's a modern name, try to cram it into something to basically make fun of my bad guy. That I find irritating. It's okay for a little bit, but, you know, three, four sessions in, I want to, you know, whack somebody upside the head with a chair. Um, But it there is... Unless the game itself allows for it, I, I it drives me buggy, and it's one of those things that I don't know why it happens. But I've been in, in multiple gaming groups over the years; it happens in every gaming group. Somebody has to have a silly name or come up with something. It's going to happen. It's always going to happen. I don't. I don't think it's a. I don't know. It depends on the the game. It really does like the game. And then it also depends on how crazy wacky it gets. And then, so if it gets kind of kooky, whatever, how you define that, I would, as a game master, if it irked me for whatever reason, because it goes against the game I'm trying to facilitate or the mood, whatever that is, then I would ask the, the player character or the player, wh- why? What is that name? How did they get their name? Yeah, what, what, why are you called Flower Bottom? Why, why are you called Flower? Because it may flower, be really, yeah, yeah, it may be a nickname, right? Then they kind of turn it like, well, because when they were younger, blah 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 blah. Then I could say, all right, so w- let me get this right: their parents or their foster parents, or you know, because everybody's an orphan. In, in well, fantasy. I look at the two guys in my group. The reason I have got Alpha and Beta because both their names are Bill, and it's easier. Neither one of them wants to go by William. Billy doesn't work. So it's Bill and Bill, and to cut in the confusion, the guy who joined the group first is called Alpha, the other guy's called Beta. Yeah. It just works. It's a nickname, and you have to explain it to people because someone's like, Alpha, really? That's your name? No, it's a nickname, and this is why. Right. So I think some of this is coming down to when we talk about setting and stuff is that in order to curtail or to help kind of better control that type of thing is to come up with a, a naming standard or a naming convention, if you will, in the setting itself. You can show that. In uh, through NPC names, place names, and so forth. If you're naming, th- if you're using um, Greek names, Roman names, um, you're using things from Norse mythology, um, Celtic legendary, or uh, Native American, or I- 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 people from India, Japan, anywhere like that. If you're using something in that vein, then people will tend to stay within that space. I think it gets, <clears throat> excuse me, goofier, or we have a tendency to go a little funnier. When we go um, to fantasy slash the made up stuff, you know, Draxel Seven from Omegaus Prime. Like, what? What's that? It's a world, and his name is Draxel. O- okay, why is he Draxel Seven? I don't know. I thought that'd be cool. It, without having some of those boundaries or something to work with, I think the opportunity for things to get a little goofy um, goes up. At least that's been my experience. So, what I try to do is provide. Either when the characters are coming up with names, say, hey, what, you're, what are you thinking of for a name? I'm thinking of this. Yeah, that fits. You're a Vrusk, you're a Zarian, you're a Drylocyte or something. Yeah, that fits your, fits your your race or the planet you're from. That fits the nomenclature or the <clears throat> excuse me, naming convention of your people. So that works. And I think that games like um, Pathfinder, I think, did this. A lot of the pre-gen characters or... D&D 5e, I know, has it, and a lot of other games do, will have names about, <clears throat> names, examples, right? Saying, hey, halflings are often named stuff like this. Gnomes are often named like this. People from uh, Draximus Prime are usually called this, or that's a um, a naming convention that seems to work. 
in those areas. So I think you can kind of keep it serious or within the bound where the silliness can stay within the proper boundaries. It doesn't get crazy by providing that kind of a, a box, if you will, for everyone to, to name and play. Does that make sense? It does. And here's the issue with silly names. This is the root cause of it. You ready for this, Brett? Lay it on me. Why are they making their character, why are they naming their character the name that they are? And is it purposely to to make fun of this, the seriousness or lack thereof? Like, are they trying to set a tone themselves? Well, as, I would, as I would tell my kids when one of my kids comes home and says, so-and-so in school did this thing. Did they get attention for it? Well, yeah. Hey, guess what? They won. Usually... In my experience, when someone's doing that, they want attention. Yeah. It's that simple. They're bored or acting out in some fashion, and they want attention. or They think it's, <clears throat> words, 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 very hilarious. There, that's the best I can class do. clown shit, right? Yes, very class clowny. Which, it isn't always, but I think that's kind of the thing. And that's, I think, the root of it. So if they want to make their player character have a unique name, We'll say unique name that tends to maybe looked at as silly by some people interpreted as silly. Then it comes down to what is the intention behind it? It is, it is kind of levity and silliness. Well, okay. Well then that's, then it's a different, then you're trying to be kind of disrupt the tone of the game, which is then as a GM, you could be like, get that shit out of here. Now, yeah, don't you that that's ba- is another way of being a disruptive player potentially, right? Right. Now, I mean, you some you know somebody uh, in the chat room, Brandon Barnes, fan of the show, mentioned somebody naming their character Roman numeral nine, which okay, which may or may not be bad, depending on the we don't I don't know anymore, right? It depends on on because somebody could say, well. I didn't know the name and I was, you know, a group of kids or whatever in this group. And, and we did, maybe it was something behind that, you know, we, we knew how yeah, to we count. could be orphans. There there were 10 of us orphans and we, I were was just the given, ninth one. and we were just given number nine. We were just given numbers instead of names by the horrendous overseer we had or something. Right. And that's how they identified each other from the other. Or you could be a set of, I don't know how many kids are are 10, 10 of the same, right? You have twins, tr- uh, triplets, quadruplets, se- sextuplets, I don't know, whatever, right? So maybe you're quadruplets and you're, you're four, right? Something like that. Eh. No, that there's, like I said, I think you're, the, the point you have is like, so your name is, you know, uh, Milo Testicles. Why is your name Milo Testicles? Really? That's your name? Testicles? Why? Yeah. Why is that a thing? <laughs> really? They actually um, pronounce it testicles? Well, that's what I, I ran into that once in, <laughs> uh, in a college in a college game. Peni Peni <laughs> Testicles. Really, really, that's your name. P. So the the, P, the initial P Ni Testicles. So the the question then for me <laughs> oh, immediately shit. at the time was I looked at the player and said, "Really? So that's a family name? How'd you get that?" Well, I just well, I, so your dad's like. Mr. Testicles, is that his name? <laughs> really? They call him that? <laughs> no, I just I just thought it'd be funny. And well, at least it's thought. testicles yeah. and not testicles. Yeah, I know. But the point was, is that it, it was one of those things where it was being used to be disruptive. The player was doing it to be a jerk, essentially, to be disruptive to the game. Everyone else was very into the setting, very serious and so forth. And it was being done to, well, I just want to kind of lighten things up. It was so serious. Well, guess what? There's eight of us and we all thought we were all playing a very serious game and you want to play, you know. Three Stooges, that's not what we're here for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's not what it's about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Again, some players, some game groups love that stuff, right? Where it's all slapstick and goofiness and barroom humor or whatever you want to have. And I guess that's fine. But one of the other, th- this is kind of goes back to our conversation around session zero is that expectation thing when you talk to players and even to game masters and like, look, you know, this is a serious game about space exploration. I'd prefer no bizarre, you know, whatever names or something that's just obviously silly, we're going to try to um, maintain a certain level of seriousness throughout. I think that's worth, I think that's worth telling people up front. So, uh, you know, Angela has mentioned, like, she has no problem putting the big kibosh down. Like, 
Yeah. Dumb oh, I don't mind it either. Get no, that, get that shit out of here. Right. My yes. words, not hers, but essentially that's what she said. Like, I have no problem putting the hammer down and saying no. Um, now VC, uh, at one point, you know, like his name, you know, he may say some people may look at his name as being not silly, right. But it's unique. But he, he says that his is like, is short for VC Joseph, which is Vache, Vache, eh. Vache? Vache, which is like Italian. Like VC, we say yeah, he English, was tell- right? Yeah, he, he mentioned this to me it's at like uh, Game Walk on, I think you yeah. we were talking about. Yeah, yeah. So, you, you know, that's not, but here's the deal. But there's a story there behind it. There no, is. it's short for this. It's a, it's a short version thereof. That's why I got called, you know, it's Tim. I, actually, my full name is Timothy. But I just go by Tim or whatever. Right. I get that. Or team. Or team. team. Some have called me Tim. Team. Yes. Um, nah. <laughs> oh shit, I lost my goddamn thought. I'm just so You know oh, I hear it here I, I just found want, it. I just want to cuss. I just want to cuss at somebody. Come I, on. I found it. Carry on. So every time I sit down at not every time, but a majority of the times that I sit down at the table, somebody makes up a name or or comes up with a name. And it always skirts something, right? It's always something I can always take a jab at. And of course, being who I am, I you do. I take that jab. Uh, sometimes it's in character, right? It's like testicles, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to come across like somebody who has done. Oh God, I don't know. Well, what, what is the what's the uh, what's the movie? Um, oh crud! It's the. Bill, was it Bill Murray? Stripes. Oh, Francis? My name's Francis. You don't touch my stuff, I'll kill you. You call me killer. Oh, whatever. Yeah, don't call me Francis. Set, or I kill settle you. down. Settle down, Francis. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's, it's one of those things. Well, uh, all right. No, I, I get it. But I think the, the point, though, is that it, you can have your jab, you can have your laugh, but at a certain point, if the character's name is Francis and, you know, don't ride the individual about it just because you happen to think it's funny and you do the stripes quote 62 times. You know, it's the same thing after remind my eight year old about if it was funny once doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be funny 52 times in a row, knock it off. You know, sometimes certain jokes are just not funny forever and they need to stop. Um, so I, I agree with, uh, Angela is that every once in a while you just need to put the foot down. And say, All right, guys, enough. It's kind of like the humor and games thing, right? <clears throat> it can go too far and you just might have to put your foot down and step on a little bit. <laughs> What? I'm just laughing at like Angela mentioned she had a player in a supers campaign who named his character Iona Lot because I wouldn't allow Iona Big a Yacht. Oh my I, I, Iona Big a Yacht. What? what? Iona Big Yacht. Yeah, I know. And then, oh then VC's like, he had. <laughs> <laughs> Shadowrun player, uh, troll, uh, named Ding uh, Doorbell, and every time someone would say my name, I would say Ding Dong as an acknowledgement. <laughs> I, think, See, I think some of these, some of it, it's goofy because it's, it's goofy, not, it, but I think it's like, oh, that's hilarious and awesome or whatever. I don't know. It's like any other joke. Sometimes if it works really well, it works. But there, like I said, to me, the point is when it becomes disruptive. We ask the player, really? That's your name? And like, yeah, I just want to be funny, and I'm just basically here to get attention, and I want to be a class clown and do everything I can. And then it starts with the name, and then every time they do anything, it becomes a joke or funny or some weird kind of slapsticky thing. It's that um, over-the-top, constant thrust or focus at humor, and that's okay, but hey, we're playing Call of Cthulhu here. We can't do that all the time, to your earlier point. It's the game, right? It, and even in a Dungeon Crawl Classics game, there's a certain point when I don't want to be rolling on the floor laughing all the time. I'm here to play a game. Well, and at the same time, you could have a player character choose a left or right of center g- name, and and it's not a joke, right? They could play it as not a joke, but it's a name that they have, and people make it a joke in the game. So it's like, really? Your name is Testicles? Yes, it's Testicles. Right? Yeah. Like, where they get pissed off. Like the player character gets pissed off because somebody makes fun of their name. Like they call you Doorbell. Like, yes, they call me Doorbell because of this one incident, right? 
And then you smash yeah. your face in because they <clears> called you doorbell. Yeah. Yeah, because you've had enough of that thing. Yeah, no, I get it. Like Sean. Somebody calls you Sean? <laughs> they call me Shane. Like, like that'll annoy the shit out of me. Right? Because we have those, right, Brett? No, it happens. Yeah, I get called Brent, Bert, Steve. Brent, I mean, Bert, Steve. Steve? They call you Steve? I was called Steve once. I was called Steve once. That was hilarious. Oh, you, you must have broke that person. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was on the phone. It was hard to break him. Oh, they're lucky yeah. they were on the phone. Yeah, that, that, that would that would that, whatever you do, folks, do not <clears throat> call Brett Steve. Steve, that's actually a joke in the house. I get um, anyway. Oh, really? Kid, the kids found out about it, and they think it's hilarious. So. <laughs> they call you Steve. Your your kids? My my older my older step kids do. They think it's funny every once in a while. Well, that would <clears> change it. the dynamic <laughs> of the show. Yeah, maybe it's it. not me, like the S <laughs> part. Maybe it's Steve. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's Sean and Steve. Brett is I don't just know. going for Brett because S and S would not like work. No, that wouldn't work at all. So I'll tell you what. Let's step away from the character names and place names and stuff. I mean, you can go to you know, mm. you know, you can go to Dingleford. You could go to Dingleford, you know, or wherever things can get goofy. Brett, we should we should make an adventure, like yes. you know, one of our patron levels, and we should have like. You know, Brett's Brett and Sean's unforgettable adventure. And then we yeah. should we should incorporate Just some of this shit. Incorporate all this stuff. Stuff, yeah. right. Good, so they have good so they point. have no way stuff. So they have no way. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, and then and then we do a serious one. <laughs> so the <laughs> like all the NPCs are like Yeah, you're sweet, you're Beard, Beardo, Beardo, Sean, I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes. Beardo already. McDingle berries. Oh <laughs> right. God. Oh. Beardo McDingleberries, NBC, yes. put that down. There we go. Got it. Now, Got it. I don't know if this is where you were going, but we haven't even gotten into the like, locations and shit like that. Well, locations, I mean, that's that's kind of the setting component of it, right? Is that when you do something with a setting, a dingle is actually a thing. It's like a small, like a Dell. It's that type of, it's an old, it's an older, uh, older term um, for basically a big ditch, if you will. Um <clears throat> But how you name things, Daggerford or Sword Coast, and you know, picking on the realms for a second, those things are all evocative, and so on. If you do something in a setting, it has the same effect, right? If you pick a name, whether it's a player, NPC, or location, then it has a has a potential to, or goes a little bit off the rails and becomes overly silly, then it can just derail everything. So. I guess I don't want to go too far down or back in time and talk about the humor at the game table type of thing because that's kind of where we're going. But the other thing that got me when we talked about names and when Matt Bonhoff brought this up and I was thinking about different approaches to it, the other thing that got me was that Game Master, GM, is the ubiquitous term for anybody who's running the game. Dungeon Master is specifically for Dungeons & Dragons. Storyteller was for White Wolf Games. Um... There are keepers in Call of Cthulhu. You're called a keeper. Um, <clears throat> let's see. There's, I mean, you, you pick another game. There's tons. Referee, that's another term I've heard in different games. The referee does this or whatever. And there is, again, kind of like in the game, in the world that you're playing in and so forth, whether you have, you know, um, you know, testicles, the knight or whomever. And if you have a referee versus a game master versus a dungeon master versus a storyteller versus a keeper, all of those words and those terms, that nomenclature can have different connotative feelings. And I know for a fact that certain game systems picked them specifically because they wanted to get away from the dungeon master approach. I know the storyteller system picks storyteller specifically because they wanted that focus, a story focus perspective. There is kind of on the flip side from that. <clears throat> I remember in the back of the Osric book by Stuart Marshall, he had um, he had chosen the term game master, and he says, "I'll quote this here: Your GM isn't called a quote unquote storyteller for a reason. He or she isn't telling you a story with you cast as the protagonist. If you want that, try one of White Wolf's games." GM creates a world. You create a character who wants something. It's up to you to go out and get it. Story is a result of the game, not a process within it. <clears throat> now, that's one take, right? And that's kind of uh, Stuart telling the world in Osric, this is why we use this term and not other terms. And I know Cthulhu, the Keeper, you know, Keeper of Secrets and so on and so forth. We have all this knowledge and, and so on. <sighs> 
I think there is the it, it's funny to me because regardless of what all of those other terms are, whatever, I always go back to game master as the most universal term. And I know the other ones, the other ones like keeper and referee and so forth, there's other connotative feelings with it, but I always go back to game master regardless. And just about everybody I know does that. We all say game master. And I know there are certain, even when you're a game playing in a game that has no game master, like, Oh, this is GM list or has no game master or whatever. I think, um, I, I, <clears throat> anyway, it just got me, it got me kind of noodling on the different terms that we use for the, for people on both sides of the screen, most specifically the game master individual, whomever that is. Sean, do you have any, what does that, does that mean anything to you? Or do you, do you care to do those terms when you read a different one? Like judge, you know, DCC, you're a judge. You're not a game master. You're not a DM. You're a judge. Yeah, it's a game master. You just don't care? Nah, don't phase you? It's, it's, they're splitting, splitting hairs, man. I mean, the reason that they don't use Dungeon Master in a lot of the fantasy games is because it's proprietary for Dungeons and Dragons and Wizards of the Coast and trademarked and all that other bullshit, which is fine. If they want to IP the crap out of that, knock yourself out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I would agree that anytime any other game, and even if it's D and D, I mean, I've heard people say, "Are you going to GM?" You know, or whatever. Sure. Um, but yeah, I think it's. Keeper, all that crap is just game master. That's just me. Referee, so, maybe because referee may, may change it a little bit because it may be where it's not where maybe you are a player at the same time as running the game, and and there may be a crossover a little bit there. Maybe that's I don't know. Maybe there is a succinct difference between a referee and game master in some games. Like if I was going to a con, say I was going to, to I don't know, let's think of something on con, I don't know, Evercon. Sure, why not? Right. And I wanted to run a board game event. And mm -hmm. it was Lords of Waterdeep, maybe, and play. And play in that same board game. Maybe then I would call myself a referee. That makes sense. Right, because well, yeah, I'm playing and I'm going to be kind of rough in the game. Um, so I think referee might kind of slide in there at some point, but otherwise, I mean, keeper and shit, I can't remember what's castle and crusades. Well, I know in like uh, crypts and things or, or crypts and creatures, excuse me, crypts and creatures, you're the crypt keeper and crypts and creatures, I believe my son, AJ's owns that and has, has run that. Um, so I guess part of me is when I, when I hear that it's similar in a way to the, the goofy player name, right? Your name is Doorbell? Really? Explain. You explain it. I'm like, oh, I get it. There's there's a reason behind it. If you're a keeper, explain what, what's the difference between that and a game master? Well, nothing. It's just a, a term. Okay. Then there is no reason for it to have anything different. If you say referee, why is there... What's the difference between a referee and um, a game master, storyteller, DM, anything else? Well, actually, the reason I'm calling it referee is because I just help... Um, run, facilitate the game itself. I'm at the table. I'm actually also participating as a player. It's just another hat I wear to help make sure the game runs sm smoothly. I'm the one who knows the rules the best. Oh, okay. Or I'm the one who's called upon to make a in-game decision or something along those lines. And I think, which is why when I read the the quote from Stuart, Mar Stuart Marshall in Osric, it was interesting because he's saying, look, it's this for a reason and this is my reason. And maybe there are other games that I own that have very succinct reasons as well, but I don't recall them offhand. This is the one that, <clears throat> and I know Judge, I believe in DCC, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe I've read something in there where the idea is, you, is you're judging, right? Because it's the OSR approach, it's rulings, not rules, it's your judgments, right? It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm making a judgment call based on this information, therefore it's this thing. That's what that, that's what that kind of brings to my mind. But otherwise, unless there is a... Um, reason for it, a uh, specific reason for it not to be called a thing. I'm like, we'll just call it that. So much like um, somebody who wants to have a really bizarre, silly name in a game, I'd be like, why, why are you doing that? Well, I want to, you know, have this X thing. We'll then coach that player and get them to name it something that makes more sense that fits within the setting and uh, doesn't cause disruption, I guess is where I'm going with that. Just to yeah. kind of tack back to it. But I think the, it just, the it, I, sorry, go. No, I was going to say that that piece that you're referring to, 
You know, it's like Angela says, names have power, you know, so I understand why different games use different names. Absolutely. But, you know, there isn't a freaking game called Overlord. Like, I'm the Overlord, right? I'm the Overlord. I, like, if there, there is a, if there is a role, there might be, right? There, if there is a role, like, hey, you are, you, your role as Overlord, I mean, with that name and connotation, it gets to the point pretty quick. Which is interesting yes. why some games where you emphasize rule zero, where the game master is the ruling, like the last say, why not call him overlord? Or judge. Judge, maybe. Right. Yeah. Uh, oh, seriously, though, a ju- you, go in, you go to court, the person who has the final say and bangs the gavel is not the you know, bailiff. It's the judge. I get into judge, judge dread. The judge. judge dread. Oh, you have a judge. <laughs> exactly. We could do that too. Yeah. But that's the, I mean, it, it has a level of finality to it or a level, level of power to it. And I do, I do agree with Angela. And that's why it's interesting to me when you say, oh, you're called a storyteller. Why? Um, now, Grant, we could get into the White Wolf game system and destroy how its mechanics perhaps don't necessarily support the uh, story based approach that they were trying to in one hand and yet mechanic the shit out of it. Oh. God, God, oh, time. did you seriously swear, man? And I oh, beat that I did. You oh, got to go back and beep one. 50 minutes, I think, in. I got to make sure oh, I note that so I don't oh. comb through the goddamn entire episode. There you go, folks. If you're live, you've heard it. When it comes out in a uh, podcast, it'll be beeped. Oh, I feel so stupid. Anyway, um, where am I going? Oh, discipline, so if- man. I'm Dude, trying. You, I'm trying. You're you're martial hey, arts man. You be everybody gets one. Bruce everyone Lee, gets one. Bruce Lee it's would not even tolerate man. He would kick you out of the dojo. I I would assume that he whacked me in the head. There is no do. There is no try. There's only do. As or Yoda, whoever the hell that's a big huge piece of bamboo right across the yeah. the, the thighs. <sighs> anyway, where I'm going is that when I hear the term keeper and so and so on, it does have an evocative term to it, and I get that. And what throws me off, and the more I'm reading game system rules and so on, and kind of tearing, not tearing them apart, but like seeing what kind of play they support, is this game going to work with my group? Because my group plays a certain way. Or, hey, I think Sean would really like this because of how he likes the game. I've played with Sean for a while now. Hey, I could see Sean digging this. Or I don't think Kevin would like this because of X. When they throw a different term at me for the game master, I want to figure out, is there something within that system that is supporting that? Or is it just they want to be unique and call you the overlord, but there's no special overlordy power or rule that you have. There's nothing extra to it. It's the same thing that every other game has. So I think, like I said, the, the reason that Stuart Marshall wrote out in Osric just is always, ever since I've read it, stuck in my head. Like there, at least somebody took the time to explain this. And again, I'm positive there are other game systems out there and authors that have explained it and they're just not coming to my mind, but this one has always stuck with me. Because if it's, you're basically just naming it something to be evocative and there's nothing to support the evocation, then there's no point. Right. At least that's how I see it. I think if there is an element. So I think many of the times that designers, developers put it in their game and they make it something, you know, strangely unique to their game, but they don't different differentiate it. Right. So it's like, Hey, you're a storyteller and this is why. And maybe they do in White Wolf, which is fine. But unless it really has kind of a strong connotation in, in that sets the mood of the game or maybe even gives it a prerequisite or, or pretense to what that player's role is, then great. Otherwise, keep it game master, referee, um, and frankly, even if they do change it and there is a connotation, shit, we're going to probably just make it up anyway. Like we're just going to call it game master anyway. Right. I don't know. Usually. I don't know. But I guess that the other piece about that is then it, to me, it kind of does flip back to the place names, the player name, the character names and so forth. When somebody says, Hey, I'm number nine. Why is that? What are you trying to evoke with that name? You know, I am, you know, Milo Fiddlebottom. What's that about? And Alpha's character said, well, this is, um, I'm a halfling, I grew up here, you know, I'm a bard, I play the fiddle, and it just kind of fell with the name, and so on and so forth. Oh, yeah, okay, that's what you're trying to, <clears throat> you're trying to evoke something with that, I get it. If your name is Doorbell, and you're a large troll, that um, that has a level of um, 
that does evoke something. You're like, okay, what's that about? Is that a funny nickname? Do I bring it up? Do I call it to his face? Do I not call it to his face? You know, and so I think that's interesting. And that's the, again, the type of question to ask. So I guess trying to come full circle if I can here is when I look at the, the GM versus DM versus blah, 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 is that role. I question why, what's it doing, what's special about it. When I go back to a player's name or a place name that is silly on purpose or, or seemingly silly on purpose, my question is always, what are you trying to do with that? Why is it that way? Yeah. Is it that way because that's just a weird family name and your middle name is Lampshane and that's just what you're called. I'm Lampshane. It's a, just an odd name. Lampshane. Yeah, I knew a guy in uh, grade school. That was his middle name. <laughs> oh, shit, man. It, Let's get- it's just it's just weird, but it, anyway. So names they I guess to Angela's point though names have power and there's something about them, and that's the other thing I always leave my players with when they pick something weird. Say you do realize you picked a stupid name, and you will be mocked for this incessantly, right? Because you picked a name that's just funny or supposed to be silly, and you may get your you know what booted all over town or constantly mocked by every street urchin you find. And you can't just go killing every street urchin you find just because you're being mocked, you know, kind of laying out the, this is what your world looks like by acting like, you know, lampshade testicles. This is probably not a good name. Just warning you up front. Lampshade testicles. Lampshane. Lampshane. Yes. Lampshade. It's very Greek. (laughs) Or whatever. (laughs) Anyway. There's the, are, there's our Greek listeners. This like you know that's they, it. Yeah, they just left. It's interesting though. Na- names as again as Angela said, names are very powerful. And they have they always evoke something when you call a thing something. It has all this stuff that comes with it, and characters can you can have something silly. Your name's your name is Toby. It's a very simple, unassuming name, and uh, when Toby becomes Toby the Tyrant, that becomes a totally different thing. So. We didn't even get into like naming places in your campaign if you're doing fantasy and things of that nature. Like one of the beefs I have or one of the things I've always thought of is why are why are things always have to be this goofy makeup kind of thing? Why one of the things that I enjoy about places, which we won't we don't have to get into a ton of, but I mean I I've had Treelorn Greenhaven. Um, you know, it's Mason Stonecutter, whatever, right? Like some of those, you know, English, old English, two names, smash them together. Even mm-hmm. with like Shadow Vale, you know, Darkwood, stuff that are, that's like English based that m- describes that area. But well, instead, we got to a- come up with like fucking my fuck, fuck, fuckville or whatever. <laughs> You just make it up for me now. Whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? Like, shit, but I mean, man, it's in the Forgotten Realms and blah blah blah, and you got to go up to Narcissusal Samamawa. That's like it's hard to remember all that crap. So let's just make it something that is very intuitive, like like Darkwood or you know Greenhaven, you know whatever. D- Daggerford in the uh, Daggerford. Realms. There's, there's a story around this uh, a dagger being used at a ford in a river in this big battle. I chose Avalon for my setting is because Avalon is very simple, it's evocative. It's a flip on that. Avalon is usually a lighter, brighter thing. It's a darker, it's kind of turning it on its head. The nomenclature and the naming conventions within uh, tend to be more common or regular usage. You get a couple fantasy, feely type of names in there, but uh, people go by nicknames. They've run into bad guys called Cutter and, you know, Stable and that type of thing. Just because that's what they were called, because it's a nickname or something along those yeah. lines. And I think you're right. Sometimes in the in the zest or desire to make something wholly unique, if you're not a linguist, making up names is not necessarily the easiest thing to do. What I've started doing is go go to your Googles and type go find an English to Norse translator, an English to Chinese translator, something. Type in the words that you want it to say. You know, land of the dragon punch it in and you can find something. Oh, that looks really cool. That's land of the dragon in Celtic. That's land of the dragon in, you know, in Burmese or whatever. And you can use those things and they are exotic is the only word I can come up with, but they're, it's a language that perhaps is not common in usage at your table. And because of that, it is different. It has a, it has a simple meaning to it. Um, but I, th- I think it, uh, when I do that, it has a tendency to ring more true, than 
some bizarre amalgamation of consonants and vowels and a couple dashes and an umlaut just to make it seem unique. Right. So we're not getting into that. We should move on and get into the die roll. We just we just got into it. I know, but all we right, could say that all for right. another place. Like if you're gonna Might start to. a new campaign, how do you name things? Blah blah blah. Like we're gonna get into all this right. goofy names. You know, I don't know. All right, I get you. All right. You're bored with me. Moving on. I gotta, if we go too long, man, you're going to swear up a storm and I got to edit all that crap out. <laughs> Die roll. Two to four miscellaneous points of gaming and geekery we want to share with you as well as inspiration for your game. Brett, go ahead. I've got two of them here. One of them is um, the basically the celebration of Rasputin's, I would say, his quote-unquote death which is about uh, over 100 years ago. Rasputin is one of those wonderful names that conjures up. You, know, you say Rasputin, um, immediately Hellboy comes to mind, and a number of other different occult and mystical traditions float around this individual. <clears throat> he is a great bad guy or someone to base a bad guy or lady off of. So uh, he's fun. <laughs> I would encourage anybody who's looking for some crazy mad priest or priestess type person, look up Rasputin, do some digging, and uh, even if you take all of the crazy hyperbole story quasi mythology built around the man, take it all as gospel and throw it into your game and it becomes a really cool thing. Link in the show notes, of course. The other one I had was there was a, uh, a great somebody's great grandmother. Her body had been donated to science and uh, had ended up being part of a U.S. Army blast test. Oh, um <laughs> They'd hoped this woman's body would be used to help study Alzheimer's, but she ended up being subject to a Pentagon's experiment instead. It basically, the whole story kind of casts a spotlight on the growing and unregulated industry of human body brokers and how that type of thing functions. I read this, um, went through it, and my first thought was uh, Knights Black Agents or something along those lines. When you talk about moving and transporting human bodies and remains, I remember stories in high school about, um, I had a teacher was telling me about how it used to be pretty easy to get like actual human skeletons for science courses and so forth because you actually, there were no regulations or very few regulations on uh, human remains trafficking, especially bones and so forth. And now that's of course tightened up in certain areas, but of course there's black markets and so on. But anyway, read that. It's good stuff. If nothing else, it's a, uh, a window or a good thing to uh, plug into your Knights Black Agent conspiramid. Sean, over to you, sir. Legend of Zelda map. It gets 3D printed. So if you're a big Zelda fan, wow! Somebody printed the original map in 3D. Uh, number two for me, Goodman Games is looking for writers to do some 5E work in 2017. Link in the show notes. So if you want to bust into the industry and you've got a good record of maybe blogging or contributing to some other publisher. And you want to maybe make some money freelance or break into the RPG industry, man. Great opportunity. Um, They're looking for writers 5e based, not necessarily DCC, which is their their game and uh, IP. But nonetheless, it's something to look into. Number three, Conan the Barbarian Complete Collection is on Kindle for free. Now that is of January 1st, 2017. It is still available for free on the Kindle. You just go to Amazon.com, link in the show notes, and get the entire series, I think. Well, yeah, a complete collection for free. Right, you got that? Um, I actually have. Yes, I do. I went and found there was a collection series, a three-volume uh, series that was put together by some folks that were actually just the book, works of Robert E. Howard, unedited, public, and put together in the order in which he published them. Versus the old El Sprague de Camp version, the little dime novel size that a lot of people, our generation saw, the little white paperback with the Frank Frazetta covers. Because most of those had been tampered with and reorganized to create some sort of a biography. And I preferred to see it actually as Howard wrote it and devised it, kind of seeing his growth as a writer and how he changed and so forth. So, But I do indeed have them. Anyway, long way around. Apparently that collection, if you wanted to buy it, was like 60 bucks. Uh, I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, Eric Tankar, patron of the show, outlines what's in store for him in 2017. He uh, uh, swords and wizardry light, and I think he's talking about a zine. Uh, you might want to check that out. He does a blog, very uh, OSR centric, but uh, and amongst other things. So Eric, thanks for supporting the show and uh, check what he has going on 
you know, on a day to day, week to week basis. Uh, he's good. He's he's good gamer people. He really yep. is. I like. I like. I've uh, been following the uh, the uh, Ten Cars Tavern for a couple years now, even before he ever patroned our show. So I'll I'll second uh, Sean there. Thank you very much, Eric. I really appreciate it. Yep. It's good stuff. And then the last one for me this week, Manly Human Name Generator. I posted this on Google Plus, and a bunch of people were like, they they just hit generate and would come up with something. Um, they're quite hilarious. As a matter of fact, one person mentioned, Matt even said, is this research for the next show? I'm like, yep. But, uh, you know, if you're talking about like doing a 70s show or what is it? The, what's the one you're playing, Brett? Superstars. What the hell is it? God damn it. That's no, no, no. Maybe it's not you. Uh, the seventies kind of genre. Oh, the action movie hero, action movie game, action, action movie, action movie world. If you, if you want some good names, that thing will, will pop them up for you. No problem. Like Very it's cool. like hammer. I don't know. There's, it was like split steel shanks or something like that came well, up. There's, there's tons these, of them. They're, they're, yeah. they're the, the corny, quote unquote, manly human names. Yeah. We do have one from a listener as well. Visionary Comms, our buddy Wayne, um, had put up one, warned us about a massive uh, an anomaly, excuse me, a massive anomaly beneath the Arctic. So uh, one of the perennial favorites is the um, bizarre things underneath the Arctic ice. So he uh satellite detects massive object under Antarctica. Well yeah, yeah, duh. I don't need That's a news source to tell me that. I know yeah. there's shit going That's... on under there. Spaceships and freaking <laughs> hollow earth. Oh Nazis. Yeah, Nazi base. There's Nazis, there's Cthulhu mythos, there's old ones, yeah. there's Shoggoths, all sorts of stuff. What kinds of shit going on down there. <laughs> yeah, it's craziness. <laughs> But I love that. I love the, I love that stuff when it pops up, and because we gamers are like, oh yeah, I knew that. <laughs> we see that shit. Oh, oh, did another one. Did another one. Uh, one hour or seven. One hour or seven. You gotta go in and hit that one. Sorry. Oh man. Well, so anyways, and I'm sad. Anyway, let's wrap this up before I go bed. Yeah. yeah no kidding, right? So, uh, Brett and I would like to wish you all a happy holiday and new year. We hope 2017 treats you all very, very well, that your gaming is as robust and lively as it ever can be. I don't know, Brett, do you have anything to say? No, I think that's about it. No, it should be, it should be an interesting year. A lot of, uh, a lot of cool stuff. Sean, and I talked about last episode, the things we want to try to accomplish. I think it'll be interesting for us to periodically, Go back and uh, when we're running a new game or playing a new thing to see if we can check anything off that list might be kind of interesting. So anyway, seriously, though, uh, thank you, everybody who we have a host of patrons out there. I do my best to thank you folks every week (laughs) through the patron post. So again, just to say it out loud, not only to our patrons, but to everybody else who's listened to the show, uh, supports us in any way, comes out to GameholeCon, hangs out with us, talks to us, sends us ideas, show topics, writes in and just tells their friends about us uh, thank you so very very much it's really very impressive and uh it's incredibly humbling actually <laughs> now that i think about it that uh enough folks put in to get a 75 dollars just to watch it so that i tried my best not to curse so thank you very much for all that yes thank you so much and speaking of friends we've had friends meet us and our friends of the show gameholecon.com go to gameholecon.com a tabletop gaming convention here in madison wisconsin held the first weekend of november the next one, obviously, will be November 2017. True Dungeon is coming back. Lots of different guests that are signing up. They're actually sent out their marketing prospectus for those that want to get into the dealer hall. So um, there is a contact there. If you're do not, if you not on that email and you are a vendor and you want to have a booth there, let us know and we'll get you in contact with somebody at GameholeCon. But yeah, we're going to be there again in full force. Um, who knows? We're going to sponsor the beer again for sure. Absolutely. And then who knows what Brett and I will come to devise. I don't know. We'll figure something, something out. Something special. So next week, I think we'll probably, I mean, it's going to be right after Evercon, so I'm going to be groggy as all heck. And I think what we'll probably have to do is go through some of the, ins- this is going to be my first um, <clears throat> live convention that I have been at least 
in part responsible for from soup to nuts through this thing. So I think it might be it might be a discussion around how that went, what I screwed up, <laughs> what went well, and it might be Sean saying, Brett, dude, why didn't you just ask me? I could have told you that was a bad idea. It might be some of that too. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. I'm sure it'll go just swimmingly for Brett and the crew for Evercon. Thank you guys for for the North Central Wisconsin area for putting that on. I'm sure tons of players are very thankful. And if they don't tell you that, I'm telling you that, Brett. And to oh, the thanks, crew Sean. of Evercon, it is no joke. I can't imagine what all goes into that shit. And so um, if nobody recognizes you, Brett, for your efforts, God damn it, I will. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Yep, absolutely. Yep. So, otherwise, uh, next week we'll see what's. Well, it's a surprise, folks. Yeah, tune in to see what's up. <laughs> otherwise, I'm one of your hosts, Sean. And I'm Brett. Good night and good game and all. This episode of Gaming NBS brought to you by the following patrons Christian Sexy Voice Serrano, Kevin Lovecraft, Joe Swick, Brett's Biggest Fan, Jeff Rademacher, Forrest Gary, Mark Anthony Benedetti, Bruce Cunnington, Eric Jeppesen, Andy Hall, Misdirected Mark Productions, Sean Nicholson, Tim Jensen, Chris Steele, Old School DM, The Knights of the Night Crew, Palladian, Jason the Beard Blaylock, Remy Billado, Jason Hobbs Hobbs, Merkel Froelich, Wayne Humfleet, James Carpio, not Caprio, Pure Mongrel, Lord Tentacle, Corey Johnson, Eric Tankar, Brandon Barnes, Mark Tasaka, Brett M. Pazinski, Tim Shorts, Eileen Barnes, Chad Knight, Dan LaValle, C.W. Mellencamp, Nicholas Abruzzo, Victor Wyatt, Tony the Butcher Baker, Craig Huber, Eli Kurtz, The Lost Sailor, Graham Minert, and Todd McGowan. For the cost of a coffee shop coffee, you could support the show for an entire month. Consider going to GamingNBS.com forward slash Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Thank you.